Can I ask one question? Sure. Into this. That one slide you had that said this is the essence of PEW. Uh, maintenance. Uh, yes, let's go back up. Engineering. Yes. Uh, and that is the essence of PEW. And so to do PEW correctly, you have to address each one of those bullet items. Certainly, probably more than that, but at least, at least these ones here. Yes. And, and these would be addressed, uh, you wouldn't go all the way through maintenance, but you would address them concurrently. You would try to make progress on all three fronts. I would start, and the way it works in fact, is um, we go back to, to our parts. Yeah? If I can control the life of these parts, I control the life of the machine, that controls the life of the plant and the success of the business. You know? so, I want to know what makes these things break. Once I know what, they, what makes them break, then I come back to here. Then I can put in the strategies for maintenance and you know, operations. Most of the success is going to be these guys here. Run the plant properly. You know, we had a curve. I showed before we had, the, um, we had this curve here that had the uh, distribution of... of uh, and this one went, on, went down. Well, that's happening because the plant is operating like that. You know, these are the peaks that destroy the life of our machines. The correct way to operate the plant, you know, the way it should be done, is like this. So I want to make sure that these guys in operations run the plant perfectly right. Because these are the killers. And they're happening because the plant's not being run right or the local environment around the part is being destroyed. Now, contamination's getting into the bearings. Uh, wear particles in between the teeth of the gears. In the case of the engine, that's when you let your teenager drive your car. And all this. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's the operation. Yeah. Yeah. So these guys, I mean, the maintenance guys can do wonderful work, and two seconds after, these guys destroy it. So I've got to make sure these guys understand the game they're playing too. The game is to be in control. They know what they're doing. How do you be in control? Well, here. Here's how you get this thing running perfectly right. And I train you up and I monitor you and, and we use our computers to feed back data to us. You know, what are the pressures and flows and temperatures? Are they ramping up, ramping down? It should, should be flat. If it's not flat, then I'm causing stress. That in time will cause my parts to fatigue. So yeah, operations, part of the success, vital to be involved. That's a tough message for some industries. I spent many years in uh, petroleum refining and the maintenance and operations and process departments did not work well together. They viewed each other as enemies and operations, their job was just to make product as fast as they could and if something broke then they almost resented maintenance having to shut things down to come in and fix it and maintenance was taking too long and they were trying to be too uh, thorough and you know get out of our way and so it's a difficult message they don't understand this that's the problem uh, look it's it's money that's that's why I've pushed so hard to talk about money if you can show them how much they're missing out on because of this misunderstanding you know, if you can show look here's a big pot of gold guys but you've got to do it this way um, that, that's the driver what I'm hoping is that the OE, the, the CEO, uh, the, the vice presidents, see how much money they're missing and drive it from the top. I want all that money because they've got a right to it. That can be done properly, it can be done very well. You know, one area that there might be some opportunities, I'm not, I don't know, but in, uh, in refining and, and petrochemicals, uh, there's really very little maintenance uh, while a unit or a group of units is operating. They have a planned turnaround. And they just figure everything's going to hell in a handbasket and we don't care. And now we're going to shut down for weeks mm -hmm. and, and uh, waste tens of millions of dollars in, uh, Unnecessarily. in operating time yeah. and go in and just replace things, replace everything and, and repair everything. But that's okay. <laughs> that's the way we do it. You know, that's a turnaround. This will challenge that. One of the things we don't talk a lot about, but which... Let me bring this up, if I can, it probably makes sense. 
brown view. So I can bring that one. What's, what the aircraft industry does in, in aircraft, when, it, when you look at um, how they monitor their equipment, they actually count these overload situations, high temperature, high speeds, high loads, they, they count that because they know that engine has lost so many hours from that overload situation. If you're going to do this um, to the ultimate, then in your process, in your refinery, you should be counting these overloads on the various assets, because it's only, it's only this overload that's causing the asset to, to degrade in the first place. Now, the operations guys from years of experience know eventually they're going to be in this zone here. Things are going to tire and will need to be replaced. So they go for the, the turnover and the shutdown because they, many parts have got to this stage here. They've only got there because of this uncontrolled operating practices. Now, if I can show them, now, if we can extend this time, this shutdown to twice as long, by having good practices and making good material choices and good maintenance. You know, if I can say, hey, we can double your, your time between shutdowns, how much money will you make from doing that? Let them tell them how much money that's there on the table. Now, now we've got them hooked. Now they're interested. And now we've just got to show them how to achieve it because the answers are all there. Been there for a long, long time. So yeah, um, the fact they're having a shutdown here is because they don't understand there are other options out there. The choice for them is to control their, their processes, manage them very well. It's become so part of the culture. You know, there are turnaround teams, and that's what they do. Turn around, yeah. shut everything down. Yeah. I'm not saying, not as if you don't have to have a shutdown, because some items will degrade, but it won't necessarily be as big of a shutdown as, as you currently have. So if you're measuring um, the life of your, of your parts, and you know, shutdown times come and said, look, well, this one's been run nice and smooth, there's been no overloads. No reason to have that overhaul. So begin to look at the, t the shutdown list and turnaround list and say, well, that, that one's okay, that one's okay, this one's okay. That might be a quarter of the size. But I've got to have real data. So now our process computers become very important because our process computer can monitor this. You know, high currents, the classic one, high temperatures, because they are causing degradation. And, and um, yes, yeah, so if I begin measuring the scenarios that lead to the stress and begin getting my guys to manage them better, and begin levelling this out to a nice flat steady line in the coming months, then everybody wins. The guys understand what they're doing, they can see it themselves because the computer feeds back how they're, how they're progressing. So I see some simple answers. I don't see this as being difficult. I think the mindset's the problem, I think the culture's the problem, but the answers are real easy. Cost of failure, we need to justify financially why we want to make a change. People won't make a change unless there's a reason for it. It's, it's human nature. Why should I change from what I'm doing if what I'm doing has been okay? Well, I've got to question the okay side of things. And in the, in the end, it's going to be a financial justification. So I've got to find a way to explain money-wise why we want to do things in a different way. If there's no value, there's no point. And I can understand that logic. So I've got to find the value, and, uh, which means I've got to understand what the cost of failure actually is. Very quickly, going to go through some accounting 101, and accountants are typically shown this particular graph here. It's how a business runs at a very simple level. There's costs of making things, there's a fixed cost, things like uh, paying rent, for example, or, or paying your workforce uh, regularly, their, their salary and their wages, that, they're, they're always going to be there. Then there's variable costs that tie back to your production rate, use of power, use of water, things of that nature there. The two costs are the total cost of production and of course you want to sell that uh, product for some profit and, uh, and we're going to have a, a revenue coming in from that, that particular uh, sale. So very simply that, that's how business works and it comes down to dollars and cents. We're not in business to make money, we're in business to make a product that clients will buy to pay us the money. So I've got to make a product that is of value because it is the clients that give us the money that makes the profit. So I'm not in business to make a profit, I'm in business to make a, a product that customers want who will willingly pay for that product and as a consequence I also benefit financially down the track. So if my focus is wrong in business, if it's in business to make money, then I've got the wrong concept. Um, I'm, I'm not doing the right thing by the guys that are going to buy the product that helps them um, improve their lives. 
So yeah, having money and, and, and have, knowing how much money is there to be made is important to understand that. How much money we're going to lose is important to understand when we have a breakdown. So what I've done here, my little business, my little business model, I've put in a breakdown. And, and a breakdown can go a number of ways. So at time T1, the machine or the process has stopped. At time T1, in terms of my fixed costs, they keep on churning through. I'm going to pay that money no matter whether I'm working or I'm not. So right away, um, no money coming in because the plant stopped. Money going out very, very fast. Now, when the plant stopped, the thing that goes through everybody's mind is to get it back into production because production is what makes the product that we sell to make the money that pays our salary and our wages. So I've got to get back into production. Now, of course, production, get on to making us back, put the pressure on. Understandably so. I can see why they do it, and, and I have no reason, have no troubles with that. The trouble is, if that's the thinking, to get production back fast, then we're going to start spending money fast as well. And we're going to start spending money on parts, on resources, on cranes and contractors and subcontractors, and that cost will go as high as it will go to get the machine back in service. So when I've got a breakdown, I have no way of controlling that final cost. It'll be whatever it's going to be to get the plant operational again. Now, if I have some stock, then I'll feed my customers out of stock. So if I can repair the problem before I stock out, the customer doesn't see the breakdown. If the time goes past that stock out stage, now the customer is directly impacted. And of course, they start phoning you up to say, where's my product? Because I'm now in, my business is now in trouble as well. In this case, I've gone into time T2, which is after our stock out. And eventually the machine is repaired, the production plant's back in service, and we're making a product. In that time, we made no product. Costs were continuing. Variable costs rose to whatever they're going to be. And that'll be a final number that ends up being on our books. And in that period, the money we could have made isn't being made because there's nothing to sell. So I can, I'm going to lose potential profits and I'm going to pay money out whatever it's going to cost to get back in operation again because it's only by making product that I actually uh, make a profit. So breakdowns destroy businesses because there is no limit on the cost. It'll be whatever it is and it can go on for a long time and impact many parts of the business right down to your own customers. If I have many breakdowns in my business, I'm in a situation like this where now there are many things going wrong, many outages. Every outage is profit lost. Every outage that goes too long is customers upset. And of course, they will wear it once, perhaps wear it twice, and they won't wear it a third time. They'll go to somebody else. And that business that you did have, that's gone. All because of your breakdowns. So if I'm in a business like this where too many things are going wrong too often, I will be very unprofitable, and I will be churning over customers a lot because they won't hang around. Now, I've got two choices with managing my business risk, my operating risk. I can manage risk in two ways. I control the consequence of the failure, how much I'm going to lose, or I control the frequency of the event, the opportunity to fail. This one here is my business with three failures that we saw before. And what I've done here is I've learned how to repair the breakdowns really, really fast. So my time T1 to T2 is a short interval. And T3 to T4 is, again, a short interval. I've got gun repair guys. I've got my parts right beside the machine. In fact, I actually designed the machine to repair very fast. So my maintainability is up. But um, in this place here, I've won back the time. You know, the time that would have been longer, I've won that back. I'm doing more production. So yes, I I'm, 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 have made some improvements in my business performance. The trouble is in this company here, it's headless chickens. This place. Everybody's busy, running here, running there. They got parts stored over here and parts stored over there and the whole place is a mishmash because we're reacting all the time to breakdowns. We fix them very, very fast, but they keep coming back all the time. This is a different world. This world here is a world where, hey, the breakdown happens and we spend the time to repair it properly. We understand the issues, we correct it properly, we get the precision maintenance and alignment and, and soft foot issues solved. Our machine is in good, healthy conditions. So though I might take the time I need to repair it properly, the consequence is I don't have the breakdowns. So in this world here, I've got a managed situation. Things are properly planned. Uh, I've got the right parts, the right engineering design. The guys understand the precision maintenance and do it properly. 
As a consequence, I create reliability. In this world here, I have reduced the frequency of failure. So I've only got two choices in the end when it comes to managing operating risk. Either I repair things very, very fast and I live in this world here and do things very, very well, uh, but they keep on breaking. Or I say, guys, that world is a very expensive world, high stress, high fatigue, um, very exciting. Great, exciting place to live. Huh? Maintenance guys here, you know, the, the gun repairers, pat in the back, pat in the back. Yeah, he yeah, broke it, he fixed it again. Well done, fix that faster this time, top stuff. So, exciting place to live. Uh, and very appealing for human nature. We love that sort of situation because guys get rewarded with compliments all the time. The trouble is, it's very bad business. This world here is a world where things are thought through, well organised good procedures, well, good training, well-skilled people that, that understand the science of, of what they're doing. Not so exciting, but a profitable place to be. So there's only two ways we're going to handle risk. Uh, minimise consequence or maximise um, or reduce frequency. This one is a, a reliability. This is the world of reliability. We do things properly, we do it once, and because we do it well the first time, it lasts a long time. Different mindset. If you're in a mindset like this, to go to this world, not so easy. Not so easy, because you know, this is a years of habit, years of culture are creating this. This is, this is being created by the practices they apply. This is a process outcome. The business processes they're using are causing the breakdowns. And I've got to change my business processes to ones that have less breakdowns to go to this world here. Can be done, um, but it's, it's a, a culture change. It's a mindset change. So yeah, we um, want to go from this world to this world here. And that takes a different way of doing things. I've got a question, I've got a challenge. Why are we doing things this way? Because it's by doing things the way we're doing that we're creating these outcomes. So I've got to find a way to challenge that and, and have this world here. If I can do that, if I can find a strategy, a technique, uh, a process, something like plant wellness perhaps, to go from this world to that world, then I'm going to free up a lot of money, have a lot less stress. My guys are going to be highly trained, multi-skilled people that can go in there and solve the problems and actually build a business that is successful and have good, the right practices. So I want to paint that picture of where we want to go to because financially it's very profitable and it's the money in the end that's going to drive our CEOs and our vice presidents to, to go down this path.